Aloha, and welcome to another episode of Question of the Week, brought to you by the Honolulu Christian Church and Evidence and Answers. And I hope that you're enjoying this series. I hope you're being challenged and that many of your questions are being addressed and answered. And remember to hit that subscribe or that like button that you see there at the bottom of your screen, or go to the Honolulu Christian Church website or go to evidenceandanswers.org and check out our website tremendous resources for you there or you can go to my youtube channel uh, patrick zuccarin and subscribe there on our youtube channel so that you'll receive an update every time we produce something new well the question of this week is this can someone be serious about science and christianity in other words, can someone be serious about science and be a committed Christian who believes in the Bible? You know, it wasn't too long ago I was at the gym and uh, one of the trainers was talking with me and she asked me a question. She said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work for a Christian organization. And she stopped me right away and said, oh, Christian, that's religion. I'm not into religion because I'm into science. I'm into science. That's what she was saying. And I looked at her and I said, well, I'm into science too. And that's why I'm a Christian. I said, the Christian worldview gives the best explanation of the scientific data that's out there. And she looked kind of surprised. And she looked at me and she said, well, you do believe in Darwin, don't you? And I said, well, Darwin never answered the origins question. How do we get life from non-life? And how do we get the various forms of life that we have today? How did, uh, you know, how was the origin, you know, what is the origin of the universe? All these questions Darwin never answered. And it's the Christian worldview that provides the best answer. You know, and she kind of looked at me puzzled. She had never heard that before. And many of us have come to believe that one cannot be serious about science and be a committed Christian who believes in the Bible. Most people in the culture believe Christianity and science are in conflict. They are at odds and one cannot Put the two together. One must either believe one and reject the other. And many of us can trace our struggles with the belief in God or Christianity to our science classes there in junior high and in high school. So it's important to, to have an understanding then of the relationship between Christian faith and science. Now, many may be surprised to discover that it was the Christian worldview that gave birth to the modern sciences and that Christianity and science worked in a complementary relationship with one another for hundreds of years. Christianity and science were allies for hundreds of years. It's only in recent times have they been made to look like adversaries. Now, Many may be surprised to discover it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to the modern sciences. You see, it's the Christian worldview that provided the framework that gave birth to the modern sciences, and it's the framework that allowed it to flourish. This is God's world, and we would expect that the biblical worldview would lay the foundation for scientific discovery in God's world, and indeed, it has. Remember, it's in Christianized Europe that became the birthplace for the modern sciences. Nowhere else in the world. It was Christianized Europe that gave birth to the sciences. Science historian Lauren Isley states this. He says, Science demands some kind of unique soil in which to flourish. Deprived of that soil, it is capable of decay and death as any other human activity, such as religion or a system of government. What is that unique soil? He states, it is the Christian worldview which finally gave birth in a clear, articulate fashion to the experimental method of science itself. And if you study the history of science, the founders of the modern sciences today were men who are committed to the Christian worldview. Many were devout disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, just go down that list. It's quite extensive. I'm, let me just give you some brief examples. Johannes Kepler, father of celestial mechanics and physical astronomy. Blaise Pascal, father of hydrostatics. Robert Boyle, 
father of modern chemistry and gas dynamics. Sir Isaac Newton, the father of calculus. Michael Faraday, the father of magnetic theory. Louis Pasteur, the father of bacteriology. Lord Kelvin, the father of energetics and thermodynamics. And the list goes on and on and on. The founders of the modern sciences were men deeply committed to the Christian worldview, and many were faithful disciples of Christ. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton, perhaps the greatest mathematical mind of modern times, wrote this uh, in his book, Philosophy of Nature. He stated this, Atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. This most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. And today, a wide range of scholars recognize that it is Christianity that provided both the intellectual and moral framework for the development and flourishing of modern science. See, modern scientists assumed that God was rational and that he created, therefore, an ordered, structured universe and, therefore, the design of the designer could be discovered. Scientific thinking, with its emphasis on experimentation and mathematical formulation, arose in one culture, Christianized Western Europe, and in no other, and there's a reason for that. See, the scientific investigation depends on certain assumptions to be true, that the physical world is real and not an illusion, as the pantheistic worldview and the pantheistic religions teach. That nature is of great value. The Greeks and the pantheists, they viewed the material world as evil or as a prison house. And it was the spiritual realm that was pure. The Greeks saw the world around them as a place where gods and spirits dwelt, as those of the animistic worldview do as well, and those where tribal religions thrive. And so the world around them is where spirits and the gods dwelt and the events were caused by their activity. Therefore, you don't mess with the world around you lest you disturb the forces of nature, the spirits, or the gods. Well, the Christian worldview taught that God created the world and that he is not in nature as pantheism and these tribal religions or animistic religions teach. Also, the Christian worldview taught that men can experiment and analyze creation and they don't need to be afraid of disturbing forces or spirits or the gods. And it's the Christian worldview that, get, that brought us to understand that God is a rational being. He designed an orderly universe that is consistent, that's coherent. It's governed by consistent natural laws that can be experimented on, discovered, and analyzed. So it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to the modern sciences. And not only was the Christian worldview the beginning of the sciences, it is also the end of science as well. See, science begins with Christianity. It set the framework for modern science to develop and flourish. And science ends with Christianity because the Christian worldview provides the best explanation for the scientific data out there that we have discovered. See, the conclusions we make of the data that we discover in science have what we call metaphysical implications and Christianity provides the best answer. For example, all right, science has shown that the universe has a beginning, the Big Bang. So now we have to answer the question, what caused the Big Bang? The Big Bang requires a big banger. Now you're getting into the area of philosophy and theology here or metaphysics. So you see the data has metaphysical implications. The universe runs on, a f on the fine-tuned laws of nature. It runs like a fine-tuned machine. And we need to ask ourselves, how did the laws of nature come to be? How did we get such a well-structured, refined universe? Well, now you're getting into philosophy and theology. 
right? So there are metaphysical implications here. The complexity and design that we see in the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, things like DNA, uh, the human brain. I mean, these are just fine tuned machines here. How did they come to be? By natural causes, out of nothing, or an intelligent creator? See, the conclusions have metaphysical implications and we're applying philosophy and theology here. And many scientists are beginning to see this and come to the same conclusion. For example, the former agnostic physicist Paul Davies comments this. He says this, Through my scientific work, I've come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. Fred Hoyle, the father of the steady state theory and agnostic as well, says this, A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology. Award-winning NASA scientist and agnostic Robert Jastrow writes this in his book God and the Astronomers. He says this, For the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. So you see, the conclusions that we make of the data in science have what we call metaphysical implications. This is where philosophy and theology come into play. So science can explain the how, perhaps. Maybe someday science can explain how everything in the universe works. But science can never answer the why question. Why are the laws of the universe in place the way they are? Why is the universe even here? And so science and Christianity have been allies for centuries, all right? So only in recent times they've been made to look like enemies. Well, next question here is this. If that is the case, Pat, how did the war between Christianity and science develop? Well, this was the result of a carefully orchestrated strategy of secular philosophers led by Darwin and Huxley in the 19th century. And their goal was to move Christianity from its position of cultural dominance and replace it with the naturalist worldview. And so they succeeded very quickly in hijacking the world of science from the Christian theistic worldview under the naturalist worldview. And there are several writings that was very successful, uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, but also one written by uh, Cornell University President Andrew Dixon White. He wrote late in the 19th century a book called A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And it's writings like these that uh, portrayed Christianity and science were antagonistic to one another and uh, were on opposing sides. And this is the view that is now held by the culture and also many in the Christian church. But today, this attitude is indeed changing. Philosophers are, of science are beginning to understand that the conclusions of the scientific data have metaphysical implications and therefore they have theological and philosophical questions that need to be answered. Okay, the universe has a beginning. What is the most reasonable cause? Nothing or a cause greater than it? Now you're getting into theology and philosophy. What best explains the fine-tuning of the universe? Natural causes, acting randomly, or intelligent design. See, now you're getting philosophy and theology. Why is the universe here? Those are questions of philosophy and theology. All have metaphysical implications where philosophy and theology definitely help and definitely the Christian worldview provides the best answer. And it's also false to say that the world religions make no claims about the empirical or natural world around us. 
The world religions make many claims about the natural world around us, and they cannot all be true at the same time because they conflict with one another. For example, Hinduism and the New Age teach that the universe and God are one. Therefore, the universe is eternal, while the Bible teaches the universe has a beginning. Here's where science can help us discern which one is indeed true. Now, scholars in science are beginning to see that science and the Christian worldview can work in a complementary and not conflicting fashion. And over the last century, there has been a lot of robust dialogue between theology and science in the Western world. In fact, the dialogue between science and theology has become so significant in our day, both Cambridge and Oxford University have established chairs in science and theology. So you can see that science is beginning to go back to the way it was um, back a few centuries ago when Christianity gave birth to the sciences and they were working in complementary fashion for centuries. So this idea that they are in conflict really uh, is a misunderstanding. Well here's another question regarding uh, faith and science. What about Galileo, Pat? Didn't his trial show that Christianity and the church inhibits scientific discovery? Now, we have to understand uh, what happened here with Galileo a few centuries ago. Uh, the myth is that uh, Galileo, through his scientific discovery, uh, contradicted teachings in the church, and so the church tortured him and threw him into prison and tortured the poor man and later on we found that his discovery was indeed correct. Well that's the myth here. Okay, What happened between Galileo and the church is quite complicated here. All right, But Galileo proposed a few centuries ago that indeed we live in a heliocentric system, that the planets revolve around the sun. The majority of scientists held in his day a geocentric view that the planets revolved around the earth. This was taught by Ptolemy and Aristotle and the scientific world of Galileo's day held to that position and therefore the church and the culture also held to that position. And there seem to be passages in the Bible like Psalm 93.1, the foundations of the earth are immovable. That seem to support the idea that the planets revolved around the earth. Well, when Galileo proposed his theory, there was not enough evidence to support his case there. And so Galileo was asked not to teach his theory as fact because it did not have enough support at that time. However, Galileo, being a uh, abrasive kind of person in his writings, responded in an inappropriate way and in his writings, he wrote that whoever rejected his heliocentric model was actually ignorant and foolish. All right, so this created conflict between Galileo and the scientific community and the church. And where Galileo ran into trouble with the church was that he wanted to reinterpret the Bible according to a, the heliocentric model that he was proposing. Now, this is where it gets a little complicated because right about this time, this is when the Protestant Reformation was coming on. And the Protestant Reformation was teaching that every individual has a right to interpret the Bible, which conflicted with Catholic teaching that only the church has the right to interpret the Bible. And so Galileo coming and saying he wanted to reinterpret the Bible, the Catholic Church at this time was very sensitive about who interpreted the Bible. So in the end, Galileo was condemned by the church, but he was not thrown into a dungeon or tortured. He spent the rest of his days at his country estate overlooking the city of Florence, where he was attended to by servants and even his daughter. A generation later, when the heliocentric model was indeed confirmed by more sophisticated equipment finally, the church accepted it without much controversy there. So the church has led the way on science and really has been uh, the foundation, you know, it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to the sciences. And so the Christianity and the sciences have been working in complementary fashion here. Well, 
Here's another question, Pat. Can science ever replace religion? Answer, no. Remember, science explains the how of the universe, but not the why. Remember, a complete worldview answers the, you know, gives answers in the area of origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. All right? Origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. Every complete worldview has to address those issues. And science can only address the first, the area dealing with origins. So it's lacking as a worldview. So you're still going to need philosophy and theology. So science will not replace religion okay, or the Christian faith specifically. <clears throat> well, come down to perhaps maybe our last question of the day, and it's this. Uh, Pat, the Bible is unscientific because it teaches things like the sun rises and the sun sets when science has clearly shown the earth revolves around the sun. Well, you have to understand the context of the Bible and the language the Bible uses. The Bible uses figures of speech that are contemporary to its day, just as we do. For example, you don't hear a weatherman on TV saying, the sun, uh, the earth will be rotating uh, this morning, right? <clears throat> or you don't see a couple walking on the beach saying, what a beautiful rotation of the earth, right? Even the weatherman says, what a beautiful sunset or the sunrise will be at 6 a.m. this morning. They still use the term sunrise, sunsets. You see, the Bible is speaking anthropocentrically, all right, from man's perspective, okay? That's why it says the sun rises and the sun sets just as we use that figure of speech today, all right? So you have to understand the context of the Bible and the kind of language that it's using. Well, you know, when I was an atheist, I would look at a beautiful sunset on the oceans here in beautiful Hawaii, and all I could think of was, well, this is the product of chance, and it'll all one day come to an end in the annihilation of the uh, Earth, the sun, you know, the sun's going to reach uh, a red star state and disintegrate the planets in the uh, galaxy and the solar system. And, you know, I'll, in fact, I'll be dead long before then and annihilated and extinct and all this will go away. And it's a product of, you know, just random chance. And it's kind of depressing, you know, when you see a beautiful sunset like that. And that's why I never really enjoyed the study of the sciences. You know, all these complex things came together by chance, and in the end, everything ends in death and annihilation. There's no intended purpose or meaning for why things are here or the way they are. Well, when I became a Christian, suddenly it made sense to the studies of science that I was studying now. I was unraveling the design of the designer. I was beginning in a small way to understand the mind of the great creator and as a christian today i now look at a beautiful sunset and say this is the creation of a wonderful god who loves us and created this beautiful creation for us to explore and enjoy and this thought fills me with joy and wonder each time i see the beauty of a glorious sunset or a beautiful coral reef or hear the laughter of a child and the whole point of our series is to bring that message of God to each one of you. That God has left his fingerprints on his creation and you can have a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible states, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. And the point of our whole series is to bring the message that you can experience the life-transforming love of God today and enter into a personal relationship with the creator of the universe that will bring you everlasting meaning and joy into your life. And that can be yours today when you accept God's gift of eternal life, the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, conquering sin and death, and rose again to forgive you of your sins so that you can have eternal life with him. 
by believing and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can have an everlasting relationship with the God of the universe. That's what we're all about here at Evidence and Answers, Honolulu Christian Church, and why we're doing Question of the Week. Now, if you have any questions, if you want to dialogue further, if you want to know more about the God who loves you and created this universe, uh, send me an email at pat at evidenceandanswers.org, pat at evidenceandanswers.org. And you have other questions, uh, other issues you want to uh, investigate, I encourage you to go to our website here at evidenceandanswers.org, evidenceandanswers.org. You'll find over 500 podcasts and other videos uh, that you can look at and investigate questions you might be, ans you might be asking when it comes to God, the Bible, the meaning of life, and Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week on Question of the Week.